Hello and welcome to the Rethinking Cyber podcast with me, your host, Rebecca McLaughlin Easton. In this third series brought to you by the Global Cybersecurity Forum, you'll hear my frank and thought-provoking conversations about the challenges and opportunities shaping our cyber future, as I sit down with some of the world's greatest minds, eminent scientists, academics, visionaries, captains of industry and policymakers. Joining me today in the studio is Professor Mary Aiken, the Chair of the Cyber Psychology Department at Capital Technology University in the United States. She's a Professor in Forensic Cyber Psychology at the Department of Law and Criminology at the University of East London and an Adjunct Professor at the Geary Institute for Public Policy at University College Dublin. Dr. Mary's extensive research spans internet psychology, online harm, child protection online, behavioural profiling, AI and much more besides. She advises governments and policymakers on the intersection of technology and human behaviour and consults for organisations like Interpol and Europol. Mary, it's great to see you and have you back in the studio. How are you? Very good, thank you. Talk to me about the key opportunities for our societies as cyberspace really becomes more integral in our everyday lives. Where do we stand today? Cyberspace is a constantly evolving environment, so we're seeing constant change. And effectively, we've got to be constantly alert in terms of the impact of that environment on humankind. And that's why cyber psychology is such an important discipline, because it sort of factors the human into the equation. So effectively, people worry a lot about addiction to devices, you know, addiction to being online. Well, we're not really online or offline anymore. We're always on. I I don't like to think of it as an addictive model because that's probably too negative. Mm. Um, And it also implies that in order to deal with addiction, that you have to abstain from the substance or the entity that is related to the addiction. But you can't abstain from breathing air. You can't abstain from drinking water. You can't abstain from using technology. It's in every facet of our lives, from how we work, to how we entertain, to how we connect, to how we learn. And therefore, I think instead of thinking of it as an addictive model, let's think about it as a maladaptive type behavior. What does that mean? Maladaption is, for example, when you get nervous, you bite your nails. Well, you can learn to stop biting your nails. And I think with any type of maladaptive behavior, particularly, say, over or inappropriate use of your technologies, you have to learn to control them and you have to teach your children how to control their use. How do we go about doing that? And if we do have an over-reliance or a dependency, indeed a, a maladaptive use of technology, what lessons can and should we be teaching our children if we're not yet independent of it? Well, you know, the interesting thing about any addiction is one of the first signs of addiction is not being able to stop. Mm. <laughs> so I would say, think about that. And the second is the impact on family and friends. So if your husband or your wife is saying to you, you're always on your phone, well, I would think you should pay attention to that. If you're distracted when you're working, well, then pay attention to that. You know, there's a myth that humans can multitask with equal sort of, you know, brain power. And that's not true. And particularly young people think this. So, you know, in a university environment, we see students at a lecture, on their laptop, with, a, you know, with, with, with their earphones plugged in and also scanning their phone. So they're doing you know, four or five things simultaneously and they think they're doing a fantastic job. But the problem is, you know, the brain doesn't divide the tasks um, equally. So it holds a lot of uh, processing power to shift from task to task. So instead of doing one thing 100%, for example, listening to the lecture, 
What these students are doing is doing five things pretty badly. But this is the model that we've built, the constructs for the future. Do we now need to demolish it and start again if it's to the detriment of our students? We need to understand, understand the human physiology piece, the human behavioural piece, and then, and then look at technological solutions. Um, for example, when we look at the area of online harm, spectrum of harm that ranges from harassment, bullying, mis- and disinformation into cyber fraud. And when we think about that and when we think about the impact of technology on young people, you know, one of the areas is in terms of being predisposed to online harm. So predisposed to becoming a victim of bullying or to being anxious or being depressed. And one of the key areas is sleep deprivation. So if your phone is keeping you awake all night and, you know, alerts going off and you wake up exhausted, then the world can be a very bleak place. How do you develop resilience to feeling forced to wake up to answer your messages and ruining your sleep and therefore ruining your uh, physical health and your mental health? And importantly, then transposing the idea of cognitive resilience to to more extreme events in cyber contexts, for example, cyber attacks. The problem is that if you look at resilience as a trait in humans, there's a strong genetic component. And the point is that if you think about resilience in general population you know, across the board and take four people in one family, one of those will be super resilient, able to cope with everything. Two out of that four will be 50-50, sometimes good, sometimes not so good. And one will have little or no resilience. Let's take some lessons out of your playbook then. How do you decompress and not touch that phone, not be alerted by it, be mindful and present all the time? What's your nighttime routine, for example, especially when you're traveling, let's say? My goodness, I'm a terrible example. I'm a cyber psychologist. I spend a disproportionate amount of time in cyberspace. Now, I really do my best to turn my devices off. I try to read at night rather than scrolling. I, I'm really careful about my sleep hygiene. I have to work extremely hard to ensure that I get enough sleep. And the point about sleep is that you need to get into lower levels of sleep. You need to get into rapid eye movement sleep, into deep sleep. And that's the way the brain sort of empties the bin. And if you don't get into those lower levels of sleep, effectively, ultimately, that can affect your mental health. For example, if you're sleep deprived, for multiple nights in a row, at a certain point, about six or seven days in, you could have a psychotic event. This may surprise a lot of people. Yes, the importance of sleep. We had a conversation the other night and somebody was saying they've three or four nights, hours uh, sleep a night. And I was like, no, that's really bad for you. Bringing things back to children, the generation arguably the most vulnerable to developing a dependency and over-reliance on technology in all its forms. What are you seeing as emerging technologies and solutions that might better protect them today and tomorrow? Well, I think the, you know, what we need, we've had about 20, 25 years of education and awareness raising, and it's not working. The problems are getting worse. So I think the point is that when we look at online harm, things going wrong in terms of our use of technology, it has the characteristics of big data, volume, velocity, variety. There's a lot of it. And therefore, we need AI and ML solutions. We need to automate solutions to actually help humans navigate uh, technology in the best possible way. And that ultimately goes back to the work of a scientist called Licklider in 1950, pre-internet, pre-devices, pre-technology, who wrote a brilliant paper called Man computer symbiosis and it talked about that symbiotic relationship between man and machine. We need tech solutions to tech facilitators, problematic, harmful and indeed criminal behaviour. Well speaking of criminal behaviour, take me inside the mind of a hacker, someone who is planning an attack. What should we be looking out for? What should we be more alert to when it comes to potential threats online? I think if a sophisticated threat actor, uh, a seasoned hacker, is targeting an individual, it's going to be very difficult to protect yourself. I think at a level, say, um, of being coming a victim of cyber fraud or sextortion or one of these, you know, you know, cyber attacks, 
I think that what you can do is just be very careful about any messages that come in that are designed to get you to act immediately. So I've been involved in campaigns with financial um, in the financial services sector. And I tell people, you have to think like a profiler. So when you get a message in, try and decode who's sending that message. Now, it may be coming from a financial institution or it may be coming from a sophisticated threat actor, a cyber criminal. And when you see words like urgent in caps, that's designed to make you act now. And when you see phrases like your your account could be compromised unless you act quickly, then that's the sort of just-in-time complex. I was able to save myself just in time because the message came in. And when the message comes after hours when you can't contact your bank, then that's another red flag. And then when the message directs you to the URL and it says something like your account has been compromised, log in to sort of verify your credentials. And then you look at the URL and it says account compromised within the URL text, that's designed to fool you. Because you read a message and then you take a quick look at the link and you go, oh, it's the link to sort this problem, but it's not. So cyber criminals are behavioral profilers. You know, they know how to target you to attack your sort of psychological Achilles heel, an attack vector. So it's important to look at messages really careful and sort of do a little Sherlock Holmes on it. Try and figure out, are you being socially engineered? Because social engineering is responsible for the vast majority of cyber attacks. Lastly, Mary, we're asking all of our podcast guests their biggest cause for concern in the year ahead and equally their greatest source of hope and optimism. What would be yours? I think the biggest cause concern of concern at a societal level is the increasing amount of... Um, Cybercrime. You know, if cybercrime was a country, it would have the third largest GDP after the US and China. And I think actually we're getting to a tipping point in society where it won't be affordable to accept this level of cybercriminality. So that's my biggest concern is the financial cost at a societal level of cybercrime. And don't forget, the more the cybercriminals win, they're more they're incentivized to keep going their primary motive is profit so that's my biggest uh, concern in terms of being optimistic uh, you know i try to be optimistic around solutions i mean nothing good happens in my day any day i wake up mm -hmm. to more and more problems but i think cyber psychology as a science as a discipline can really help us to navigate this space can really offer solutions and ultimately can lead to the generation of a safer and more secure cyberspace for all of us. Which is a perfect note to end our conversation on, Bida. It's been great to see you as always. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. My thanks also to you, our listeners right around the world. And if you'd like to hear more conversations like this one, just head to the Rethinking Cyber page on Apple and Spotify. Another podcast episode in this series is coming very soon, so do be sure to follow GCF on social media for updates. I also look forward to welcoming you on the ground at the 2025 annual meeting of the Global Cybersecurity Forum. Until then, take care and goodbye.